Okay, it's time for Ask the Experts. I'm Jill Schlesinger, and I'm joined by... Jack Otter. And Ray Martin. So we are the Money Watch team that's going to take you through the next uh, few minutes. Not, I was going to say hour, because I could talk to you guys for hours. But uh, first and foremost, uh, the uh, canary in the coal mine today. Got a couple of ideas for you guys. First of all... um, we know that this special election in Massachusetts means something big. It means something big to investors and to politicians and to citizens. Ray, what does it mean for the stock market? Well, this is the Scott heard around the world, right? Nice. Scott Brown's uh, election here. Very good. Uh, I love that. Yeah, yesterday, the market uh, surged partly because you had a drop. People looked at his buying opportunity. But you look at the health care stocks, insurance stocks yesterday going up, you know, uh, now they know what happened, so you sell the news, right? By the room, we sell the news here. But I think IBM's a little bit into it, too. Uh, the IBM earnings this morning, at least I heard, their uh, 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 income looked good, but their revenue the top line wasn't as strong as they needed. So that might be weighing on the market a little bit. And but I got to say, I was in Boston yesterday, ah. and everybody was talking about, go out and vote, go out and vote. There were people leaving my office in Boston, carpooling and picking up other people at work to go vote. And for who? Scott Brown. Wow. Well, um, Jack, Yesterday, the market rallied the day before the election. Today, the market is right this moment down 133 points, a one and a quarter percent move. And uh, at the end of the day, is this really is is the health care bill going to change the, the, the passage or not pa- the, 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 maybe the failure to pass health care reform? Is it going to impact the stock market? In the in the long term, I don't long think term, so. Yeah. I mean, I, I was saying a year ago that healthcare stocks look like a good investment, just as they were during Hillary Care days, because either nothing would pass, in which case we'd have the status quo, or it would pass and it would turn out not to be as bad as we thought, or the companies would adapt. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we do have more insured people, odds are they will be more people sending checks to insurance companies. Wait, didn't we write that in an article? for some uh, publication didn't that you and I worked on and we picked health care stocks. Didn't we do that for one of your friends, your old friends? Rings of Vague Bell, yeah. Did we did it get published? Do we get any do we get any props for that or not? Uh, I think Men's Health published something with your name in it, in (laughs) fact. And they misquoted you. Oh great. That's terrific. Anyway, uh, so whatever. You know it happens. Uh, I just want press. I don't care if it's good (laughs) or bad. All right. So assuming that this is not going to be the long term B and uh impact. There are some other things that are coming out today and, and yesterday and sort of economic news. And one of the things that we note is that there is no inflation and mm. that housing is sort of okay-ish in a bottoming pattern. Uh, what are the likelihood of those two pieces of information? What's that going to be the impact on markets as we go forward here? You know, inflation, Jack, what's the, the good, the bad, and the ugly of the inflation story? Well, infl- inflation is a funny thing because we all look at the macro picture and we say, how can we not have inflation tomorrow? But just like my son in potty training, it's always tomorrow. <laughs> and um, I hope his problem is resolved before inflation gets here. But the, the point is that uh, in the short term, the forces continue to be uh, practically deflationary. While the long-term picture certainly looks inflationary, um, with this housing starts number, your know, housing starts were down, and yet people uh, building permits were up, so they're adding to supply as demand shrinks. That is not an inflationary trend. Uh, Ray, the number here is, and, and Roland, you can put this up on the board because I just <clears throat> found this at census.gov. That the uh, so here we have building permits uh, at six hundred fifty-three thousand, which is uh, ten point nine percent above the November rate. So up. Housing Mm -hmm. starts 4% below November. Mm -hmm. What is going on in real estate? What is going on in housing? Why isn't it getting better? Make it better, Ray. Yeah, right. You know, I I think you got a a couple of forces. I mean, I'm not going to get into the month-to-month numbers because that's just noise. Yeah, you're right. And you're also comparing it to, you know, a December period of time. Really, I'm, I'm really interested in the spring selling and summer selling season, okay, and see how that goes. But uh, you know, right now, you've got people backing off and reconsidering their real estate altogether. People are, there's a shadow inventory of houses, people in houses that they'd like to sell, like to get out of. Uh, there are some people dipping into the second home market and thinking there's some good that. opportunities out there, right? 
Uh, but uh, then you've got folks that are sitting in the home that they're in, and it's not the equity and the asset that they have. I and mean, this is going to be a drag on the economy for a while because our economy was based on people using their houses in ATM, mm. taking the cash out of it. And that that's that has not been fixed, and I don't think it's going to be fixed. You're going to have to live off, for a long time, you're going to have to live off the natural formation of new households with people immigrating to the U.S. and people getting married and having kids and saying the space we have, we've pushed it to its limits. Can we expand it or do we have to buy a new one? And that's just going to be mm. a long slog. It is going to be a long slog. Well, yep. that's what happens when you have prices double yep. in six years, uh, right? Uh, and then, yep. as, right, 2000, yep. 2006. Oh, we didn't have the bubble like Japan had. I mean, Japan well, had we, a wait, monster like, okay, but wait a second. bubble there. Okay? That's my comparison? Like, yeah. I got to go to, like, the worst country in the world? Yeah, to, you, you, know? Know? you do. Oh, you do. God. I mean, I mean, you got to you look at that and say, okay, the it second wasn't worst. as bad as that. Not okay. nearly as bad in that depth of it. But... Uh, you know, the, 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 the yeah, house now, uh, you got to look at it and say, maybe this is an inflation uh, inflation hedge. It's going to gain by that, and it's not going to be a place I take a lot of money. Matter of fact, I'm getting telling people, if you have the cash and you can pay down or pay off, pay off your debt, your mortgage. Okay, hold on. This is great because yep. we're going to get into some questions from friends of Ask the Experts. So yep. I'm going to get to some of these questions, and this one is from Emerson. He is a first-time mm-hmm. home buyer. Mm-hmm. You ready? Uh, he wrote to me personally because I, I sometimes am on the 404 podcast on our sister CNET networks. So um, I know from hearing you on the 404 that fixed rate mortgages are the way to go. I was wondering if there is a difference besides time between a 15 and a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. Are there any other fine print things a first time homeowner should look for? Do services like lending tree work or should I just walk into a bank? <laughs> Thanks. OK, Jack, 15 30 year. You and I actually had this discussion. We did. So we did. what do you think about the 15 versus the 30 year for Emerson? Well, if you can uh, run the numbers and afford to pay off your house in 15 years, there's a lot of good things about that. Now, I, I, the one big but is that academics have looked at it. And the more the higher your income, the better off you are diverting that money into a 401k rather than paying off your house early. And for the purposes of this study, they considered a 15-year mortgage paying off your house 15 years early. Uh, That said, you you can't quantify the satisfaction and the peace of mind you get from owning real estate outright. Right. And and so, Ray, also, the I know that you will actually probably, you know, we need to know more about Emerson, but let's talk a little bit about how for a lot of people – it's not a great choice because you're you need your cash flow, right? Like if Emerson had two kids and needs to fund college and put money in a 529 plan or put money in a retirement plan, right. the 30 year mortgage may be uh, his only option to some that's extent right. because he needs his cash flow, right? That, that's uh, that's right. You, you need to make sure that your total housing costs, which is your mortgage, principal, interest, taxes, insurance and uh, maintenance costs on the home and any association fees. Really shouldn't be more than I, I like to say twenty five percent or less of your gross or less. That's the top line I go with folks because I believe people should have a healthy positive cash flow. Should be, live way beneath that, not just max it all out. Right. And just barely squeak squeak into their four hundred one k enough Ray, to get a match. What, what, what was but the, on the fifteen what, thirty, on, let me, wait, let me ask one quick question. No, uh, fifteen or thirty. It's not even trade. It's not just the time thing. You pay more interest on a thirty, not only because you pay longer, but the interest rate is usually a hundred basis points higher than a than a fifteen year. You right. get a lower. You can get a four and a quarter percent interest rate of four and a half on a 15 whereas a 30 you're going to pay five and a half 5.75 maybe close to six now let me ask you a question at yep. the height of the boom yep what were housing what were people like what percentage of their income was going to housing yeah you know, as on, far I mean, on a I'm, national yeah, basis yeah, yeah. yeah i mean uh banks were approving uh 33 to 36 I saw a bunch at fifty percent. Percent, okay. Five zero oh, on sub on subprimes. You could argue one hundred percent because people didn't even have the income to pay the loan, and they were paying, int- not even all the interest. They were paying an option arm with a minimum payment, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now here's your next thing. Do you want Emerson to go to Lending Tree, or should he walk into a bank or work with a mortgage broker? Jack, what did you do? You work with a mortgage broker or your existing lender when you did your research? Uh, I worked with a financial advisor who had relationships with um, various banks. And I'll have to say four and seven eighths. You know what? He keeps rubbing this in my face a little bit, <laughs> and and I get it. I would be bragging also, but you know, I didn't get four and seven eighths. Yeah. I got five on my refi, and Not I got bad. five and an eighth on the purchase. Okay, Ray, what about Lending Tree and online mortgage services? What do you think? Well, I, I, 
I, those are probably good alternatives to look and shop and compare. I've heard mixed reviews. Some people mm -hmm. I've heard said they got a good deal and they were able to do it. Other people said it's been cumbersome and they didn't get the good follow through. Um, I've found from the people that I've had direct experience with, they're having a better experience working with a bank that originates mm -hmm. and underwrites the loan and then sells it to a big bank like uh, J.P. Morgan Chase or uh -huh. uh, B of A, as opposed to working directly with the bank themselves. Huh, uh, interesting. And there's something wrapped up in that. We'll talk about that in a little while. All right. I'm going to skip around and go to that right to this question, though, Ray, because you say that a lot of your clients have had a hard time refinancing because obviously they're not jack and mm -hmm. they yeah. can't get four and seven eighths and turn the loan around <laughs> in five minutes. What's going on? What's going on with the refi market, well, even with people who are qualified? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll give you two two examples first. One is a fifty percent loan to value. So you know the house is worth uh, you know let's say maybe a million, and they're looking for a loan of four hundred thousand. So even less than that, a forty percent loan to value. Uh, and the bank is saying, well, we'll do the refi, but uh, you know you need to show us uh, a letter of verification of employment, tax returns, bank statements, deposits. All fine. That's good old fashioned underwriting. I have no problem with that. They came back and said. Well, give us a letter from your employer that says you will be employed for the next yeah. three years. <laughs> I'm not making this up, okay? Oh, my got God. Got another client. Got a, got a condo in Boston. Okay, it's a two-unit house. Legally, it's just structured as a condominium, so they own half as a condo. So the bank is saying, J.P. Morgan Chase is saying, give us a homeowners association questionnaire and audited financials. Well, it's oh a two-unit house. We don't have an association. We don't have financials. Banks are asking for things that sound reasonable but they know the borrower cannot come up with and now instead you go to a bank that originates an underwrites loan then we'll sell it then they'll sell the mortgage to jp morgan chase no problem uh -huh. why because the underwriting bank is taking counterparty risk willing to take back the mortgage yep if it's not paid off if it's if it, if it goes into fault within a year for example so banks don't want to take the direct risk, but they're willing to offload some. It's mm. a tricky market. It is. Jack, how is your process? Did you feel like, you know, you got a good, if you have a good credit score, obviously that's going to be Well, these people key, had right? all that, and they and had so millions, multi-million in portfolio assets. Did, did we have to sign affidavits that you had a job for the next three years? Well, it's still, <clears throat> excuse me, it still hasn't closed, so who knows? Those, oh, my those God. Those documents may be forthcoming. Okay. Well, I'll sign anything for you. All right. All right. All right. Let's <laughs> talk a little bit about the other end of the market, because we were just talking about people who are in good shape and they're trying to refi, the foreclosure market is pretty much, you know, percolating, and the, the modification process has been somewhat stymied. Mm -hmm. um, of course, that, that may be actually good news for housing because all those houses didn't come on the market and get barfed out. But um, <laughs> So we have a friend of the show who's going through a foreclosure process. Actually, I just want to say that Megan, our producer, wrote the woman's name down, and the, the name is such a um, unique name that you can't put that name down and not have her know who it is so let's just say a friend of the show is going through the foreclosure process right now and she wants to know is there any way to get around speaking with mr quote unquote phone support at your bank because <laughs> if i could i think we may have had a better chance of getting somewhere with our mortgage modification ray mr phone support what, yeah, how got, do we get around Mr. Phone Support and go to Ms. Decision Maker? Yeah, you, you got to be assertive. You got to know the lingo. You got to know that you're asking for the supervisor, the loan modification department. Um, you got to you know, tell the person respectfully, look, I don't think we're making the progress we're making, and just push the issue. Now, I, I'm not a foreclosure expert guy. I don't work with people right. who are in foreclosure. Maybe you guys do, but I don't. Uh, but I've only worked on, in the last year, one person. It was incredibly time consuming. Mm. I did it as a personal favor, a pro bono work. And, you know, I'm. I'm pretty good on the phone, okay, and I've got 23 years' experience as a practicing financial advisor, and I've worked on the inside in financial institutions. I know how they're built and how they work, and I had trouble oh. getting to the right people and getting this done. So it's it's tough, and 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 banks are understaffed. They have right. not staffed up for this problem, and they're not going to because they don't view this as a long-term issue, and it's not a profit center for them. Right, so and 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 and, and, you, and it's interesting with a loan modification process is that you actually have to have someone with a brain. On the other end of the line, that's the other thing because these are somewhat more complicated yeah. than just and a little science. bit of authority. Yeah, and and you, it's a lot more, and, and so I think that that's one other problem. Now, now our yeah. friend also wanted to know that is it true you have to default on your loan in order for the bank to even consider you for loan modification? Jack, I thought it was you had to miss three payments. I think that might be the, but what's the deal? Do you well, know? Well, I, I think that as you said, the reason you said the person has to have a brain is because the person needs judgment. Mm. And I think a lot of these things are judgment calls. I think there probably is vast inconsistency in the way different cases are being handled. 
And so while there's no one size fits all on how to cure that problem, uh, a lot of phone legwork will certainly help. Mm. Um, and if you can make the bank understand that they will end up with more money in their coffers if they work with you, you know, very often a short sale will net them more than a foreclosure will. Probably usually it will. Um, but uh, how do you convince the monster not to eat you to do something else instead? It's a tough place to be. Uh, our friend was told, Ray, mm-hmm. that she could not attempt a short sale, sale unless she has attempted to modify the loan and have been declined. Is that the case? I didn't know that to be the case. I, 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 that's news to me. I haven't heard that. I, I, have, I have done one short sale for a friend, a uh, piece of Vermont property. This has gone like 10 years ago. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think the problem with the short sale is the bank wants to know the transactions at arm's length. Yeah. They want to know they're getting a fair price. And that's all wrapped up in, you know, because you're saying, well, I'll sell it to somebody for less and you'll eat the difference, Mr. Bank. And, you know, the banks say, hey, our investors have to go along with this, too. And we've got to make sure maybe we're better off just foreclosing and maybe we can get a higher price ourselves. Right. So they've got to balance all those risks and all those problems. So if you can bring a willing buyer and it's a reasonable price, you know, the bank should listen to that. But I don't know that there's a structural requirement that you first have to go into foreclosure or pre-foreclosure before you can do a short sale. As yeah. Fact, I don't think that's, I, I don't know that's the case, but there is the government's website, the Home Affordability Modification and the Home Affordability. Uh, I think it's uh, HAMP.gov, yeah, but yeah, let me look go, that up. Go, go to that and that'll tell you about the government programs. Look up that website for us and, and that will answer a lot of, I think, a lot of these questions factually, at least for the government sponsored programs that many banks have to participate in. You know, it's very difficult because when we look at home the- Home Affordability Modification, right? Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that becomes uh, very discouraging is that you're trying to be the responsible person. You want to try to hold on to your home. And, you know, Mm -hmm. the first wave of foreclosures, let's be perfectly honest, you know, we knew that these were people who were probably in houses they couldn't afford sure. and got but but the second wave is really people who were affected by the recession jack i mean these are people right. who that you know i'm we're a married couple you're working Aww. at one place i know we, we are cute <laughs> it's really sweet i just i could finally be i could finally get entry into the wasp world <laughs> well, i'd love that we'll work on it um so one of the things that i think is is important there is that though that you know we may have been a married couple making x amount of dollars one of us loses our jobs now all of a sudden things get tight. We still have to pay for our kids' education, you know. So the second wave is is the the really constitutes the people who have been hit like this by the second wave of the recession. These aren't the deadbeats, right? I I think it's that's part of it. I mean, certainly there's some deadbeats who hung on for a long time and are now finally buckling under. Uh, but you know, I'll be Jack Downer and 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 Uh-oh. go back to um to Ray's point in, in that couple's case. If they were paying 25% or less uh, of their income on housing, they could probably muddle through after losing one income and still make their payments. Yeah. Um, so what's going to happen out of all this process is that houses will start costing less. <laughs> and therefore, there'll be a smaller portion of people's incomes. And gradually, we'll get out of this problem because real estate will become a reasonable percentage of of our net worth instead of a completely out of whack with historical norms percentage well you know and and, and that really is a, that's the point right that's a great point jack makes and leads you into your last case because the last case is probably a great example yeah we're yeah. going to do this but uh by the way yeah. first let me just put that's this up point. it's making home affordable.gov is the that's help it. for america's mm-hmm. homeowners and here's kenny the boston area homeowner who is not ray's friend but he is kind of this various person. Okay, here is an interesting question. I don't know him. It's not, I, my, it's not, not my friend. I, it's not my enemy. No, he's not mine. <laughs> but anyway, just remember, remember, there's two parts of the plan, though. One is refinancing and one is modification. That's it. Home so affordability that's, refinance and home affordability exactly. modification. Exactly. So yeah. anyway, check that out at makinghomeaffordable.gov. Here's the last question from a Money Watch fan who is a real estate broker, of all things. <laughs> Successful <laughs> but handled my money poorly. I like someone who I just coughs it up, right? I I screwed myself. My company has recently gone out of business and I am in pre foreclosure trying to get a loan modification with the bank. I owe $50,000 on credit cards, gulp and a tax lien of 75,000. All right. Get this one. The condo that she owns is appraised at 645,000. Her mortgage is 158,000. Should she sell her condo, pocket the money, pay off the debt, 
rent for a few years or should she muddle along? Ray Martin, financial advisor to the stars and everyone else, what do you think? Well, just, just look at this clinically. Now you go into the office and you know, get your blood pressure taken, temperature, and all that. Well, let's do that here. Okay. So debts, mortgage, credit card, tax liens, $283,000 in debt. Okay. Yeah. The asset, the only asset they're telling us, and they're not telling us location, so I don't know if it's Nevada or if it's, you know, in the Midwest, Montana or whatever, but as a condo for $645,000, I got to believe it's on the you know, metropolitan area. Uh, so that's the asset, right? So the net worth is $362,000. You do the math, you know, 645 right. minus $283,000. And, you know, Jack made the statement earlier, uh, you know, that net worth all tied up in one asset category, real estate. That's, if, if you're not telling us you have anything else here, and I doubt you do if you got this tax lien and these right. credit card debts, you shouldn't probably don't have any other assets. You're over-invested in real estate. Um, you know, even if you sold the property for 583000 not the six forty five you think it's appraised for, and paid off all your debts of two eighty three, you come away with three hundred grand. And that's nice, especially because you don't have a job right now. Yeah, grants real change. <laughs> that's real money here in 2010. You, know, you, could, you could rent for a while. You could go probably buy. You know, Oh, I'm going to sell at the low. Okay, but you'll buy in at the low, too. And the it's a lateral move. And, and the market isn't running away from her yeah, anyway, probably right? Probably not. You know, and, so, and, you know, and I get really... Buy down. And if she stays in there, isn't she just going to keep racking up debt anyway? How could she possibly the interest stay on ahead the, of that? The interest on the debt. And right? The tax lien's going to end up in wage uh, garnishment, but there doesn't appear to be any wages here either. Look, Lucky for you, you don't have a job. They can't garnish yeah. your wages, Jack. Your credit will be destroyed. You know, th this is a great example of this strange mystique that still surrounds real estate that right. we haven't managed to shake despite what just happened. I mean, if this woman was sitting on that amount of some other asset, she wouldn't even be asking us the question. Right. But she somehow feels that she's not supposed to sell this house. And yeah. it's not just her. I mean, this we all get this feeling and, and we've got to shake it. I blogged about this a couple weeks ago. Getting over-invested in one place, you end up with nowhere to turn because you have no flexibility in your financial situation, no options here. Yep. There were no options left. This financial plan is a disaster because it was leading all to one thing. I'm betting on real estate. Even my career is on and real estate. And that's the other thing. She works in the business. So, of course, exactly. you know, it's, it's terrible. So here's the other thing about uh, our friend here. I, I just say it's a disaster, but my God, how lucky is she? She has an option. Sell the goddamn thing. Get your money. Relax. Put your game plan together. Keep some cash on hand. Like yeah. emergency reserves actually matter. Assuming you can find a buyer. Yeah, assuming you can find a buyer. Even and you know what? Even if it's a crappy bid, hit the bid. Who cares? Get your money. Five eighty. I, mean, I, I, I don't even know the location, so I can't. I can't even comment. And not that I would. She, you know, she's a realtor. She can get professional advice. Right. On what to sell this for? But at that price point, people can get a conforming mortgage of four seventeen. Come up with enough down, and at historically low interest rates and a first time home buyer tax credit. That house is in the upper end of what's selling. It's a tale of two real estate markets. Anything much above that is not moving. So that point or lower is probably moving. So you might go to... And I, I, I think so too. Jack, you $300,000 in assets, as your mother would say. We should all have such problems. We yeah. should all have such problems. Okay, um, I'm going to say goodbye now because it's there. Megan's giving us the high sign like we got to get out of here. Got it. Um, you guys... As she should. Indeed, we should <laughs> shut up already. I just want to say that you are the two coolest cats... Thanks for doing Ask. In this room. In this room, at least. Ask the Experts. I'm Jill Schlesinger. I'm Jack Otter. And I'm Ray Martin. For MoneyWatch.com, thanks for listening. We had a great time. Send us lots more questions. We'll answer them every single week. You guys are all cool for cats. <laughs>